Good morning, everyone. I see there's quite a lot of people here. Thank you for coming. We should be talking about uh, Linux kernel and user space and the boundary between those two. And I'm curious uh, how many people here, let's say, consider themselves C programmers, at least a little bit. Ah, pretty good. And uh, what about kernel code? in any system, Linux or other. Okay, that's quite a few people as well. Not required. Anyway, um, what I'd like to be talking about uh, the, at the beginning is the code execution on the systems with uh, Linux. Uh, if you have some code, it is executed either as user space code or as kernel code. And uh, even in the kernel, it does not mean uh, the process is not present. So kernel code can be executed in uh, interrupt mode uh, during runtime or in the context of a process. This is important. We will uh, be also talking about uh, virtual memory, which is really uh, closely related to this topic. And uh, you always need to know uh, your code in, in what context uh, it is running. And the context, uh, um, okay, let's say the word context uh, is a little bit overloaded, but the context uh, do switch, do change in uh, some events. And one of the events is a kernel preemption. Kernel preemption is a timer-based event that, for example, uh, switches from one process to another. That is the goal. But the preemption itself, the very, uh, the very uh, beginning of the task, uh, just uh, switches from uh, any code in the kernel or in the user space uh, to some uh, asynchronous uh, interrupt uh, handler. In uh, that case, you may wonder what happens next. Uh, when you are in interrupt uh, for scheduling, uh, pre preemption scheduling, in that case, uh, you want to choose what will be running the next. Uh, for the beginning, you can imagine uh, just a single core system. So you can imagine just one thread of execution run at one time, uh, switching to another. So what I'm talking about is the scheduling. Scheduling from preemption, that's uh, one, of the, one of the possible cases, gets you from uh, the preemption code to the process code. And then um, process context in my slides usually means uh, some kernel code run for the process, usually. Um, you may then want to uh, consider other cases when uh, uh, user mode and kernel mode uh, are switching. And one of them is the system calls. Who of you knows how system calls work? Okay, not so, not so many, not so many actually. So for example, on uh, Intel x86, which is a pretty common, a pretty common example, uh, if your program is running, it has a access to its own virtual memory, so it cannot access the kernel. It's, uh, the kernel is protected. And uh, your code needs some uh, service from the kernel, like uh, file system access or network uh, connectivity. So in that case, your program has to call to the kernel somehow. That means the CPU core will have to switch to privileged mode and will have to run code in uh, the process context so that the kernel knows uh, who's asking for the service. But at the same time, it's already in the privilege mode. So it's some sort of uh, software interrupt, let's say. Yeah, you prepare uh, all, the, all the input data uh, into CPU registers and then call an instruction that switches to the kernel. So the process context here is code in the kernel serving a specific process. Uh, normally, uh, in your programs, if you call a function, 
you usually take it as a granted action. Like you call a function, it exits, you get the result. Uh, when switching to and from the kernel, uh, sometimes it's uh, useful to consider this uh, as two, uh, two different events. One is uh, the system call to the kernel, and the other is the returning back to the process. So basically, from the context of the process in the kernel, you are turning off the privilege mode, uh, speaking uh, x86 words, and then you let the process code run. So you can imagine uh, that your program has a stack for executing various uh, functions, but also uh, it has another stack in the kernel, which is handled by the kernel, and there does not, uh, there, your code does not run, but the kernel routines uh, for, for uh, the services that you need. And all this is closely related to uh, virtual address uh, mapping. You can imagine that if uh, all code has access to all memory, addressing it uh, physically, then it might be hard to protect the memory of one process from another, for example. Or to protect the kernel memory, because kernel handles the services from a uh, non-privileged process like uh, a service uh, for the user that can, that can even run uh, with a specific uh, operating system privileges or uh, authentication authorization. So in that case, uh, virtual memory is basically uh, the protection feature that you need to uh, keep uh, your whole system secure. Uh, you could have other means, but the virtual memory uh, is very effective because the very access from the CPU to the memory is already protected. So in the context of a process, you have certain memory pages mapped into your virtual memory and uh, this mapping is accompanied by, uh, the, by the permissions. So you know which pages you can write, which pages you can read, basically. Yeah. And uh, already the hardware knows uh, what you can do and what you cannot. In that case, um, the hardware needs to react to the situation when you access uh, pages uh, that you don't have access to. How many of you heard about a page fault? Cool, almost, almost everyone. So this is exactly what we call a page fault. A page fault is a hardware um, exception that says that your process attempted to access memory that it cannot. One example is when it accessed a memory uh, that uh, is not available at all. For example, a virtual address that is not mapped in any way. Another example is uh, accessing a memory that you can read and you would be able to write, but uh, for now is shared with another process. This sounds uh, a bit difficult, is the copy on write uh, case in, in this slide. And this happens uh, in, in forking, in creating new processes. When you create a new process on uh, all Unix systems, uh, this makes a clone of the existing process and they share the memory, but only temporarily until one of them writes to it. So it's not a, sh it's not a shared memory, technically, but it's uh, shared for reading temporarily just to optimize the whole process. Because sometimes you will not need to access the memory. So if you don't need to access the memory, it would be a waste to try to duplicate it at the, right at the beginning. Very often, if you create a new process on Linux, the next step is to uh, replace the new process with uh, some other program. It's the classic fork plus exec uh, scheme. And in that case, uh, you basically don't use the memory. So you don't, you don't want to do all the operations, all the duplication, so you just uh, let uh, copy and write handle it, and if you, need the if you need to write the pages later in the child process or in the parent process, a page fault occurs, and always what happens if uh, the page fault occurs? Does anybody know? I'm pretty sure someone does. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, I'm just uh, looking for the best words for it. Interrupt is good, but uh, the kernel has to handle it. So some kernel code has to handle the page fold. It uh, can be regarded as a special context because uh, you know, there is a request from a process to a memory that is not available, and the kernel is supposed to handle uh, this situation. This has one small issue. What if the page fold happens in the kernel code? What happens? If this happens in a, in a context of a process in the kernel, it's exactly the same case as when it happens in a process. It doesn't matter whether the code is in kernel or in user space, but if it happens in uh, some interrupt handling routine, that is a problem. So you need to be careful about which operations you can run in the kernel. If you're just writing applications, it's all handled, it's all okay for you. The page fault is uh, somewhat similar to a syscall, to a system call, in that you are basically passing the control to the kernel, the kernel is supposed to make a quick uh, set of actions to fix the situation or to serve you some service in, in, in the syscall and then returns control back to the process. If you heard about, about uh, a uh, context switch, a context switch is usually uh, a term used for switching between different user space processes. So this is a thing that doesn't need to happen here. You just switch to the kernel and back. And depending on the architecture, there are optimizations. Uh, x86 is uh, optimizing very easily because uh, in x86, all the time you have mapped all the kernel memory with some small exceptions. So you have like a region in the virtual memory mapped to the kernel memory, a region of the virtual memory mapped to the process memory, like the user space part, and you have a flag in the CPU uh, telling whether you're in user mode or in kernel mode. In kernel mode, you can access all of it. In user mode, you can access all the user part. So easy. Because this depends on the architecture and because Linux supports many, many architectures, I don't even know the details of uh, those things for most of them. It has some internal routines for the kernel developers and kernel driver developers uh, that uh, can copy from user space and copy to user space. Those are basically uh, C uh, memory region copying functions. And in the case of x86 with uh, this uh, kernel mode, user mode switch, basically you have all the code in the memory. Uh, the, the, the example here is uh, when you write to a file, you are passing a buffer to the kernel with the data, and the kernel needs to copy the data from the buffer to its own buffer. So it's basically just memory copying. If it was an architecture that has like stronger um, protection without any such optimization, it would have to handle it in some other means, the copying from user space to the kernel space. So uh, in order to make it universal, uh, those functions are like the ubiquitous way in the kernel. You can search for them in the, in the kernel code and they will do uh, those operations all the time. So um, if you have a process in the virtual memory, then uh, that means you can have many pages that are, that are mapped to physical memory. If there's no special case, if there's no special pages, you can basically access the memory in your programs. Uh, those programs get translated to some binary code that uses instructions for uh, storing data into memory and taking data out of the memory. Uh, depending on the architectures, uh, those instructions are connected uh, or uh, incorporate uh, some computations or they are just uh, moving around data between memory and registers. Uh, you would have to read the details on different architectures for that. 
so um, that is pretty easy. Um, what happens um, on the x86 I already uh, talked about, so let's switch to the next one. Um, the thing is that the virtual memory uh, may be shared between uh, multiple uh, processes. So that is the case of an explicit shared memory, which is supported by Linux, or it is also the case of implicit sharing of all process memory that happens between threads. In Linux, this is uh, pretty simple. Linux tends to, be, tends to be very simple regarding task management. Uh, tasks are basically processes and individual threads as well. Sometimes uh, threads are called like, lightweight processes because it's a, it's a few processes in the kernel that behave exactly the same way as any other process. They are just sharing the memory space. Uh, the hardware and, and, and Linux also supports shared memory. I told you about that. Um, how many of you actually used shared memory in your code at some point of time? Good, like three, four people. Uh, cool. Um, do you know what's the uh, biggest advantage of shared memory? Fast interprocess communication. Why is it so fast? It's memory access. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. You know, it sounds so obvious, but uh, if you don't work with a shared memory, you might not think about this uh, because it's just two different processes uh, with virtual pages mapped to the same physical memory, which is shared between them. Now it becomes more interesting in a multi-core systems because if you uh, just switch between processes on a single core, then uh, this is not so interesting because there, there's a lot of overhead in, uh, in the context switching as well. It could be used, but uh, it becomes much more interesting in, uh, in a system with many cores where you can have multiple processes or threads accessing the same memory at the almost same time. Synchronizes on the memory level. Uh, you don't need to care about that. Um, if you want to uh, modify some values in the memory, there are atomic memory operations in all modern uh, systems, so you can write a code so that you can be sure that, for example, you are replacing some value with another and reading the original value or incrementing with getting the information about what you increment, and you get all this in a single instruction, which is atomic. That means another process does not uh, see the intermediate state at any time. So you can use this to any sort of uh, synchronization. We will talk about that later. And if you have uh, processes and threads, uh, memory can be one of the shared resources. Another uh, shared resource is a file descriptor, which lets you access uh, any res not just files, any, any resources. Uh, file descriptors uh, in Linux are, for example, for network connections as well. This doesn't make any difference. There's more shared resources. I, I just picked uh, the most important ones for, for uh, our topic. And you also may have, even uh, with uh, threads, you may have some resources that are uh, local to the threads, that are not shared between them. They have some memory which is local to the stack, for, uh, local to the thread. For example, the execution stack, because the threads behave as separate processes, so they need to have their own execution stacks for calling functions and execu executing code. They uh, can handle signals from uh, the kernel. As signals on Unix are passed to processes, usually. So you need to choose uh, which of your threads will handle them, or you can uh, let all of the threads handle, handle uh, uh, the signals. The signal will be delivered to one of them uh, based on, uh, based on uh, some uh, kernel processing. And there are some signals that are thread-specific. Some are inherently thread-specific because they are not 
as asynchronous, like uh, for example, CPU uh, exceptions, like division by zero and stuff like that. I just looking back to the previous slide. If I missed something, um, do you have any immediate questions about uh, virtual memory? No, cool. Because then uh, all the time virtual memory is with you. Uh, all the time you, you have to uh, cope with the memory and the memory mappings work behind the scenes. And sometimes you have to use them uh, for your own advantage. And you can uh, use the memory uh, for synchronization. Uh, we are talking about uh, IPC, inter-process uh, communication. That means between the user space processes. I'm just leaving out all the process to kernel communication right now. But even in that case, the kernel plays a crucial role um, because it has to pass the messages between the processes in, in some way. We talk about shared memory. So that's a possible alternative, which is very fast because it's just memory access. But in many cases, uh, this is not uh, exactly what you want. So on the kernel side, uh, the main uh, concept for synchronization is a wait queue. A wait queue is uh, just a list of uh, processes that are waiting for something. It's a very, very simple structure. Uh, by waiting, uh, we mean the processes are sleeping. That means they don't need any uh, CPU. They don't need any code to be executed for them, and they're not doing anything. That's uh, one of the goals, because uh, on a system with a, a huge number of processes, uh, many of them will be idle, completely idle, just waiting for some events. Uh, if you imagine like a web application, the backend will be waiting until someone uh, sends a request. And during that time, that specific backend process is not needed, and it doesn't make any sense to do some empty computation, so we let it sleep. If uh, you know almost all processes are sleeping almost all of the time, then you can uh, turn on individual cores, you can save energy and stuff like that. So you have uh, idle tasks that are waiting for something. Usually those tasks are idle just because they will be needed later. And uh, you have tasks that will uh, wake them up. Or sometimes they will uh, get uh, woken up by, for example, network traffic, incoming, incoming requests over the network. Uh, one very special example is uh, the uh, task management or uh, child process management where you can wait for your child process to exit, to uh, finish its work and, and quit. It's one of the simplest uh, syn synchronization primitives in uh, Unix. You just run some task, uh, process or thread and wait for it to exit and pick up the result. You can uh, have blocking uh, I.O. It means you send something over network. And uh, at some cases, uh, it happens that uh, you already send a lot of data and the kernel buffers are full, waiting for the other side to accept the data. On TCP, this happens quite often. And in that case, you may want to uh, block your process because it has, it has nothing to do. So it's a classic like scripting example. You download. Uh, some data from the network, so you're waiting for the data to arrive, and then you send some other data to, for example, the same server, make a new request or something. And there is a, one specific example I would like to talk about, and it is the uh, fast user space, mutexes. How many of you know what a mutex is, mutual exclusion? How does it work? Many of you, cool, uh, who doesn't, um, if you have two processes and they need to wait for each other, and you may need this uh, even for threads and even for shared memory applications. For example, one process writes to the block, block of the memory and the other wants to read it. So it needs to wait until it's fully written. So uh, 
they can use some sort of semaphores or whatever, but the simplest uh, structure for this is a tags. So the first, uh, the first process locks down the memory using a special data structure just for locking, and the other one is waiting for that uh, for that lock to be released so that it can lock it for itself and then it can do the reading. And during the reading, it expects that nobody will be writing to that region. So it's a, it's a synchronization model, very simple one. A, a slightly more complex one is a semaphore which uh, works with a number. So for example, if you have a semaphore of uh, like uh, value, value five, that means uh, it can be locked or it, we don't say locked for semaphores, we say uh, downed uh, to four, then by another process to three, two, one, zero, but it cannot be downed below zero. So a semaphore with the uh, initial value of five means you can have five processes using the resource. There are use cases for it. But let's stick with a, with a simple case uh, with mutual exclusion, which is um, exactly the same as a semaphore starting with one, so that the first process that locks it down goes to zero, and the other process waits until it's again set to one and can lock it down to zero for itself. Uh, and uh, what a fast user space uh, mutex is, that's a specific data structure used in Linux that does exactly this. And much more. It's a, it's an extended. It's not just a protect. It's an extended data structure that can uh, serve uh, many synchronization purposes. And it's called a user space mutex. That means uh, you don't expect it to call to the kernel all the time. And that is exactly done with the atomic uh, atomic values that you can access and that you can modify and read at the same time by uh, specific uh, CPU instructions. So uh, this, is, this is how you do it. Uh, if you want to lock a putex, it's uh, ready for you to get locked. You just lock it. That means you run this one instruction to change the value and it's yours. And you can continue immediately. So it's basically, uh, either one or just, just a few instructions to handle, handle all this. If uh, you want to unlock it and nobody's waiting for it, in that case, you can simply give it back and continue execution. So it's uh, super fast. There's no uh, switching to the kernel, there's no system calls. If you were at uh, the talk by Pavel Tishnovsky, he talked about S-trace, you can check with S-trace that really there are no system calls done to the kernel at that time. So when, uh, when do we need the kernel? Because it is a feature of the kernel uh, and library. When you need the kernel for Fudexis is, uh, for example, when you want to wait for something that's not available. Because in that case, your process wants to sleep, and a process can only sleep by calling to the kernel and getting unscheduled. And the second case is when you need to uh, wake up another process so that it can take the lock. In that case, you need to call to the kernel so that it can wake up the other process. So in those cases, you call to, to the kernel. In the cases where you don't need to wait and don't need to wake up another process, you just keep all in, in, your, uh, in your code, in your instructions. So it, it's super fast in, in that example, in that case. And on the kernel side, this uses a wait queue. That's the, uh, that's the data structure that works on the kernel side, but you know, um, what is what is more uh, what is easier to program uh, kernel code or user space code? Who thinks uh, user space code? Okay, and who thinks kernel code? Oh, good, all good. Like three, four people. Um, yeah, yeah. Both uh, answers are correct from different points of view, of course. Uh, but in this case. Uh, in the kernel, you can do anything with the hardware. In the user space, you can use the features that the kernel offers to you. 
So in user space, if, uh, if the kernel gives you all the features, it's of course easier because you, you're just using services that are readily available to you. But uh, in the user space, if the kernel does not offer you what you need, then it's, uh, it's very hard to fix. And sometimes you may only fix it with uh, writing a kernel module, so going to the kernel code. Yeah, so in this case, yeah, Linux is pretty good in, in, in that, or any POSIX system is, because they offer you a complete set of things that you need for, for normal programs. But if you want to you know, make your programs uh, faster than usual, you may need to look into more details, uh, which is the point of uh, this uh, discussion and this presentation. So what do you uh, use uh, Futexes for? Uh, using Futexes is uh, a little bit difficult and tricky because they have some pitfalls. Sometimes they wake you up if, if they don't have to and, uh, and stuff like that. So you, you need to be careful about them. It is much easier to use uh, the tools that use Futexes on the background, which is uh, like thread Futexes. And there you can uh, easily combine uh, threat mutual exclusion together with uh, threat uh, condition variables. Condition variables are uh, somewhat similar to the weight cues in the kernel, but they are used together with the, with the mutual exclusion. So one uh, thread creates an event and wakes up all threads that wait for it. Other threads can wait for it so they get woken up by, uh, by the, the original caller. So that's uh, mutual exclusion with uh, condition variables. That's what you usually use in, in uh, common threading models in user space, including POSIX threads or P threads. You can use semaphores, which are, um, they can actually replace uh, the, the mutual exclusion together with uh, the conditions, so you can use semaphores uh, for your advantage if, if, if it's more convenient to you. On uh, Linux, uh, you can use all of them in any context. It's good to remember it. You then just need to uh, go to the documentation and carefully find out how, uh, because uh, mutexes in pthreads belong to pthreads, not processes but you can create them in shared memory. You can turn them into uh, inter-process mutexes and you can let them do the job on, uh, in, in a shared memory area. So you can turn them into inter-process mutexes. Not so easily, but uh, not so hard either. Uh, the same way with the semaphores. Semaphores are easier because they are inter-process by default. So if it's inter-process, you can easily use them between threads as well. Uh, also, uh, the, the question is uh, how to use um, shared memory, uh, semaphores, maybe mutexes sometimes, but mostly semaphores and stuff like that in a client server model. That means the server creates, for example, the shared memory area, and the client is started without any reference to the shared memory. In a parent-child context, this is easy. You create the shared memory, then you create the ch children, and the children inherit the reference to the same shared memory. But if you don't have that, if you have a server and clients that connect to it, which is quite a common optimization uh, because the clients can have, for example, read-only access to the data structures of the server, so it's protected, so it's still somewhat protected, so in that case, you need to connect the shared memory or connect the mappings in the client with the, with the existing ma mapping in the server. Who knows how to do it? How? Shared object in file system? Yeah, that's a good answer. Because on, uh, on uh, Linux, uh, you can do all of this with uh, just file descriptors. You can use a file descriptor to create a memory mapping to a file. You can create a mem memory mapping shared. That's just a flag for, for the MAP call. Uh, 
and therefore if two processes do it with the same file, they have file descriptors, uh, file descriptor numbers for the same actual file. In that case, they get the same shared memory blocks. So it's not, it's not that difficult. If you wanted to ask about semaphores, semaphores are based on shared memory, so they use the exact same approach. So this is all based on file descriptors. There are some other ways, like if uh, some of you uh, use like POS6, uh, or not POS6 uh, mechanisms, but System 5 mechanisms, which are also available on many systems, uh, they use some uh, numbers that are not file descriptors. That's an alternative. But on Unix, a typical way, on, in, on POS6 system, a typical way to share resources is file descriptors. And I, I know if, if everyone in, in this room knows this, but if you have a local communication on uh, Linux or on other POSIX systems, and you have file descriptors, you can pass them over the local communication, for example, over local sockets. So you don't even need to just open files randomly on a system, but you can uh, you can directly choose. Uh, okay, I have an open file. I have an open socket to uh, some uh, resource, and I want you to have it. And in the in the classic uh, POSIX uh, sockets, like the Unix local sockets, it's possible to tell the kernel to give them. A file descriptor for the same resource, so you can you can use file descriptor passing for this. Yeah. That's all for the uh, synchronization mechanisms. I don't go into more more details because uh, we would have to talk for a week, not for less than an hour here. But uh, if you send me an email, I can I can direct you to some uh, some resources if you want to. Uh, so I would like to switch to another topic, which is uh, the buffers in the kernel usually, or actually the buffers in the user space in the kernel because you need to move around the data between user space kernel, other user space process, or on the network to other computers. So uh, they are basically everywhere. And uh, if you uh, think about a simple buffer, like a memory area, which is used to fill in some data and then read it out, then uh, basically on uh, Unix, we are talking about a pipe. That's a buffer that's accessible to the user space because uh, a writer can send data to the buffer repeatedly, so it can fill it up to its, uh, its limit and a reader can pick up the data from the buffer. You could talk about some details about the buffers, what happens if you, you know, uh, read and re delete from the beginning at to, to the end and such stuff. Uh, usually this can be handled by a circular buffer so that you continue writing again from the beginning if there's free space and so on. But this is uh, implementation details, important implementation details, but, but still details. My kernel pipe, which you use even for connecting simple processes in the shell, like grabbing some lines from your logs and stuff like that, that's, uh, that's uh, basically just a buffer. Uh, what you can use for inter-process communication, like for sending actual data, from a big uh, buffer or from some data structure in one process to another process. So one of the one of the options is the simple pipe. Another option is a Unix local socket, which works almost like two pipes in different directions. So you can send the data, but the other end can also send the data. So you need two buffers for that. And you can use uh, message queues which are sort of similar, and it's also a buffer. It's a buffer for messages. Does anybody know uh, why would you use message queues instead of uh, sockets? Yeah, you don't need to have the reading process uh, open 
right when the data is ready. That, that's that's uh, okay. Yeah. Why why is it so important? Synchronization. There's one specific case when you really uh, need to use uh, a message queue instead of a uh, channel, a socket. And that's exactly what I'm saying by the word channel. Channel is like a data pipe or two data pipes in different directions between two processes. So if you just want to give up some messages and let anyone handle it, like if you have a pool of processes, then you can pick them up then uh, this does not happen with the sockets. So you can have a message queue. You can, for example, it's just one way to use it, fill it with one uh, process that prepares the data for the others, and the others can pick up the messages and handle different tasks. And the original, uh, the original process, the writer, does not have to have sing, uh, individual connections with all the processes and does not need to handle the choice of the process to uh, send to. So it just fills the message queue and the process just pick up uh, new messages when they are ready. And of course, in a multi-core system, uh, those uh, threads or processes can run on different course. So uh, it's it's an optimization technique basically. I'm not going to talk more about uh, shared memory because we talked about that already in some way. Uh, shared memory is, uh, is difficult to use in, in a way. But uh, as for uh, the messaging, I have just one simple note that might be interesting. It's an advanced thing. But let's say you want to share data uh, between two processes. You don't want to use shared memory because it does not give you any guarantees and it's, uh, it's difficult to um, keep, it, uh, keep it right. So you just want to pass a message from one process to another. And that means you're copying from the user space buffer to the kernel buffer, and then later from the kernel buffer to another uh, user space buffer. At the same time, uh, this requires the original process to pass the data to the kernel, meaning to also uh, give, uh, give the kernel uh, the time to, to give, up, give up its processing. But at the same time, uh, we usually expect that the original process will need some reply. So it's a client for the server and it needs some reply from the server. And uh, all of those techniques that I talked about are uh, essential, essentially asynchronous, meaning I send the data and then if I want to wait for the reply, I need to call the kernel again and tell them, okay, but I want to wait for a reply on some channel, okay, pipe, socket, whatever. So this, uh, this uh, means that in turn, you can switch often between the processes and you can have many context switches. It uh, may not be entirely um, optimized if you need that. And you might want to uh, do this in a different way. Uh, it's possible if you make uh, a module for it in the kernel, it's possible and some, uh, some kernels do it to just ask for a service and wait until the service gives you the reply. And at the same time, if you use this technique, you can uh, get around uh, the double copying because uh, essentially the kernel handles all the processes. So it should be possible to copy directly from one user space buffer to another user space buffer. It's just not so easy because even the kernel works in the virtual memory and therefore, uh, this is not, not the usual way kernel operates. If it's in the context of the first process, it has access to the virtual memory of the first process. And it would be difficult to look up the pages of the other process, map them, 
and write to the other process. On the, on the other hand, if you are already at the side of the reader or the service, at that time, you no longer have simple access to the original process because you're in another context. And the way, uh, the way you can do it uh, on Linux pretty easily, I was, uh, I was surprised that it was not even hard, is that when you're in the context of the first process, when you have access to the data, you lock the pages so that you have them available for, for later use. So that is the uh, get user pages. And by locking, I mean you don't want those pages to go out, out of the memory for swapping, for example. Swapping means that some pages of the user processes are not in the memory, but are put to the disk until they are needed. Then they are put back into memory if, if someone needs this information. So in this case, you can lock the pages from being swept out, but then it's uh, just physical memory. So you can use KMAP, and you can use KMAP in the other process context already, you can choose. And KMAP will map uh, that uh, uh, those pages to the physical, uh, to the, sorry, to the virtual address space of the kernel. So basically, you have the original buffers available, but mapped to the kernel. But you're already in the context of the other process, so you can use copy to user from the kernel space. So this is like a nice optimization. If you want to look it up, uh, look at uh, the exact functions that I have here. I'll send the slides uh, to the organizers, so this will be available online later. Do you have any questions? Uh, the question is about the comparison of Futexes with a, with a classic Futexes that are handled by, fully by the kernel. I have no comparison like that. I did not even read any benchmarks. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes? Um, great question. The question is uh, whether when the process calls to the kernel, it is possible that the pages are already swept out and when we call get user pages, we would need to handle it. We could possibly handle it because get user pages has, has access to all the kernel uh, information. But uh, this case is not different from the normal operation. Uh, imagine a call from the writer. The writer calls write, so it sends an address, a user space address of its buffer to the kernel. And the normal way of operation is that we uh, read from that buffer to, and uh, put the data in some kernel buffer. In this case, the change is that we lock down the page, don't read the data, or lock down multiple pages if you want to, uh, not read the data right now, and just uh, store uh, the data structures about the pages uh, in uh, our uh, driver data. So it is not so much different. We just don't read the data, we just uh, log the data for later read in the context of the other process. So this is handled. Thank you for the question. Maybe a last question. Uh, 
Um, I'm not, not sure if I understand the questions correctly now. Uh, th there are zero uh, zero copy mechanisms for like network operation uh, in the kernel to limit the number of copying the buffers around, and this uh, this case solves the user space to user space case. But many often you copy around all the data like in the kernel. So most of the zero zero copy uh, optimizations are about just keeping one or a few buffers or some data structures and move around just references in the kernel and keeping all all this synchronized properly. So if if you want to, uh, uh -huh. Maybe this is not for a question, but rather for, for a longer discussion, so we can talk later. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for coming.